What happens when the world gets turned on its head? We're forced to look inward, perhaps become fearful, sometimes lash out at others. While there are others in the world who don't give up hope because they believe in people. Join me, Kevin Tibbles and Amy Goldberg, for our new podcast, Believe in People, where we meet those who don't give up hope. Today's guest on Believe in People is a woman who uses her talents in the world of design to spread awareness of all things equality. Deanna Dorsey Calloway's clothing label urges us to trust Black women and more. And she's recently partnered with Hollywood giant Ryan Reynolds to create new opportunities in underserved communities. Diana, welcome to Believe in People. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's such a pleasure for you to be on. Thank you. Uh, we have, um, we want to be, before we sort of get into your newest endeavor, which is called Creative Ladder, uh, we first want to uh, dive into your a bit of your past because you are a creative entrepreneur, you're a brand strategist, you're a fashion designer, and I'm sure you do a lot more than that as well. Um, how did you get started on your career path? I always knew that I wanted to do something in fashion. Um, I didn't fully understand what that meant as a young girl and as a teenager and as a college student. Um, And I think after graduating from design school, moving to New York City, getting my feet wet in the fashion industry a bit, um, I was able to kind of pull together all of the ideas that I wanted to do into my entrepreneurial journey. Um, I was laid off, made it through around about 15, 16, 17 rounds of layoffs, I believe it was in New York City, and was blessed to have a home to come home to in a city that at that time wasn't suffering economically. And um, when I came back to Washington, DC, this is November, 2009, I couldn't get hired, so I hired myself. Um, You know, there were, job opportunities available, but I didn't fully understand my worth at 29, but I had some version of understanding of it. Um, And I just wasn't willing to take such a serious pay cut. Um, That's when I say I couldn't get hired. I should say I couldn't get hired at the rates that I would have liked to have been hired at that point. Um, Hired myself and and started my entrepreneurial journey officially in... um, December 2009. Is that something, um, first off, aside from being in fashion and all those other things, you're also a mom, uh, which is also a full-time job in today's world. (laughs) But when you say that you were laid off and you were blessed to have a home to go home to, are, uh, I mean, just tell me, I mean, straight up, how difficult is it for a woman in your position? to find jobs in design, in fashion, in media. Yeah, I mean, this is, you know, if we can journey back to 2008, 2009, um, when the Great Recession, I don't, I don't want to, I don't know if that was when it first hit, but that was when it really sort of affected, hit my industry, the fashion industry, and, and hit me pretty hard. Um, at that time, um, you know, the world was changing. The fashion industry, I believe, was the first to get hit and was hit pretty tough. Um, living as a single woman at that time in New York City, there were certain things that I needed in place to remain safe um, in terms of where I lived, how I lived, <clears throat> excuse me, as well as how I would travel back and forth to either, um, you know, little pickup freelance jobs that I was able to get but wasn't able to sustain. And um, it was tough, you know, when I say I was blessed to have a home to go home to, I had two parents um, with a home that was safe, that was secure. I 
was, you know, came home to my dad's house in Washington, D.C. But leading up to that, I had friends who were, you know, pretty much on their own in New York City um, who might be sharing my couch, you know, sleeping on my couch, couch surfing for a little bit. Or even at times we had multiple people. So there might have been other folks in the industry that were sleeping on the floor. Um, It was it was a really it was a really tough time. And I think um, I learned at that time how to, you know, everyone's favorite word now, pivot, um, how to also be innovative, how to be imaginative and how to deal with the highs and lows of being um, in in a creative industry. Um, Also just in a country that was dealing with some economic downturn at that time. And um, thankfully one of my homes, my father lived and and still does, but in Washington, DC was probably the only place in the country that wasn't suffering economically. Um, And I just assumed, oh, I'm gonna go back to Washington, DC. I'll be able to get a job. I've had this amazing experience. I went to design school overseas and it just was not the case. Um, I think Washington, D.C. has changed quite a bit. They are much more now um, as a city, even I guess in the tri-state area, much more now welcoming and accepting of, of cre- and, and understanding of the importance of creative creativity and in creative industries. Um, that, that wasn't necessarily the case in 2008 and 2009. And wondering then, how did your business take shape then? From there, you were you, know, you were turned down or looking for jobs. It's a challenge, 15 to 16. I mean, you have to be pretty strong and resilient. You have some, some um, tools that you use to help you stay focused and decided, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to now start my business. What did that look like for you? Yeah, it wasn't so much me saying, okay, now I'm going to go start my business. If again, you can journey back to November, December, 2009, there was this thing, and I hope that it's still around. I'm not even sure called Craigslist. And uh, I went to Craigslist and started looking for organizations that needed creative assistance because at the time, um, the jobs that I was, you know, applying for, potentially interested in, they all thought that my portfolio was too fashion focused and and based. And so my goal was at the time in November and December, 2009, to expand my portfolio with more, um, let's say NGOs or just Washington DC type organizations and businesses that could show folks, um, you know, that I had a wider range of skills, a broader range of skills. And, um, by I'd say January, February of 20, 2010, excuse me. Um, I didn't realize it myself. I just remember coming home and um, managing a lot of the work that I had. And my dad saying, Oh, you've got a business. If you have more than one client, the fact that you already have one client, you know, you, you have a business. And um, by March is when I became sort of official, official and had um, an attorney, you know, get me standing up and so forth in terms of all the Washington DC business licenses that were needed. But I, I, I kind of fell into it. It wasn't my initial goal. My goal was to expand my portfolio so that I can get back to making 70, 80,000 that I had been making in New York city. Um, Hmm. And I I realized, (laughs) excuse me, I realized um, then um, whoa, I can, I can do this. Um, you know, the next day I said, I can't, the day after that, I said, I can't, and <laughs> an ongoing battle <laughs> ever since, but, um, it kind of, it kind of happened to me quickly. And I was blessed to have folks around me to help me realize the things that I didn't quite yet realize, um, both in myself and, and the things that I was actually already doing at that time. You market or you sell the uh, t-shirts and the like. Um, with a message. And I'm just wondering if that message is something, well, tell us about the message and tell us a why and tell us whether or not you now feel like as a result of what you've gone through, um, that you're a role model. Well, I don't know if I would go as far as to say I'm a role model. I think I am a young black woman or a pseudo young black woman, um, pseudo young, I should say, um, 
you know, figuring out in public and trying to make it work for myself and for my family. District of Clothing came along um, about four and a half, five years after the creation of Deanna Dorsey Design, which is the first organization, the first creative direction business that we were just talking about. Um, I ended up having a prime client for quite some time. We had a wonderful relationship. I had, um, I did not have to worry about some of the typical things that most entrepreneurs have to worry about when they first get started because I had a prime client that I was working with and serving um, consistently, consistent, consistently, excuse me, on retainer for um, the first four and a half years of Deanna Dorsey Design. They went on a spending freeze, <clears throat> excuse me, during the summer of um, 2014. And again, you know, life happens and it's just sort of like, whoa, what do I do now? I'm one of those um, CNN entrepreneur statistics and how do I make this work through the rough months? And um, at that time, again, if you can journey back to 2014, podcasts were really kicking off and masterminds and masterclasses. And I was in a co-working office space um, in Georgetown with several other women entrepreneurs. And we just kept hearing all these podcasts talk about multiple streams of income. And a you know, a bell sort of went off in my head. I could remember my my parents and my family talking to me about making sure that I was building an additional stream of income. And um, that's what eventually District of Clothing came to be. Um, she, I refer to her as she, she launched um, officially six months later, seven months later in, um, in Washington, D.C., at the, the very beginning of December 2014, it was the Google Politico Women Rule um, Marketplace. And, um, you know, the, the, the focus there was not only to have an additional stream of income and to help with the rough months, but the focus always also was to be able to give back in a way that um, so many people have given to me. I've always felt very um, encouraged. I've always felt very supported. And I wanted to be able to provide that back in a positive way um, on apparel because it was something that I knew I could do in my sleep. Um, I could set up the website quickly. I, I should say I could design and set up the web, website quickly. I could do the branding and the materials fairly quickly. And um, I pulled together the skills that I already had to hopefully, you know, bring in a multi, an, an additional stream of income. Um, the goal with District of Clothing really is to serve as the tool to help the doers, the dreamers, the change makers, the future history makers um, continue doing what they do. So, um, you know, my thought there is if we can, you know, encourage people with positive messaging and, you know, reminders of self-love and, and of local love, um, why not put that on a shirt? And show people how you feel because um, you can't always say it and um, allow that to be an amplifier for the things that people are already doing or to be an encouraging tool for folks to be able to do what they're doing. I would say sure, that well, the some of those who messages. we design for, sure, sure. Um, I would say that the people who we design for, those are the role models. They're the ones that are constantly inspiring me. Um, and if you you know, if you think, especially here in a city like Washington, D.C., pre-COVID, <laughs> you could go to brunch with someone in March and they're telling you about this amazing idea they have. And then the next time you see them in May or June, they've already had, you know, one or two events. They've raised lots of money and they're helping, you know, push a great cause forward. Um, our, the linchpin to District of Clothing is our Dreamer Doer collection. Um, and so the first, the top line says dreamer, underneath it says doer and dreamer sort of crossed out um, mm -hmm. almost as if it's like a to-do list thing. Um, and that's just because we believe that in order to be a, dream, a doer, you first have to be a dreamer. And, um, you know, we want to make sure that we are encouraging people to take action on their dreams. Um, some of our other items that are very popular would be the do not touch the artwork. That was 
Um, again, pre COVID, I usually would spend my Mondays, um, as I would call them, museum Mondays for inspiration for the week ahead. And I was constantly always saying, you know, do not touch the art artwork, do not touch the artwork. And then also, if you can kind of journey back to um, a few years that we've had, just thinking about some of the um, injustices and things that have happened against um, women and and young men as well, where they um, were harmed in various different ways by other people. I believe that, you know, the human body is the most beautiful piece of art. And I created that to be in support of the Time's Up movement. Trust Black women. You know, I'm a Black woman. I'm raised by Black women. And um, again, I think it's really important as an artist that you present what you know to be true to other people who may not know that yet. And even if you can't have a conversation with somebody, they can see it and they think about it. And oftentimes it, it comes back to them. Um, and I think that it's also a wonderful tool for people who believe in those sentiments to be able to wear them, to express to the world, how they feel. Um, that mm. came really very much to like a, a beautiful moment during a very wild chaotic sad um and just backwards time i don't know how else we can call 2020 but um a lot of our items that we knew to be true you know dreamers and doers and change makers and future history makers and um change maker making less change trust black women stand with black women a lot of the items that i designed um really kind of came to the forefront during 2020 um and you know I think it's important that as artists that we constantly share our truth. And if people aren't there just yet, then the moment will eventually catch up to it. And that's kind of what 2020 was for us with District of Clothing. And, and Diano, did this then morph into, um, into Creative Ladder? Because I, I was looking at your um, site and it talked about the survey statistics. And it's actually quite surprising. It says four out of five creative professionals of color didn't know their careers existed in the when they graduated high school. So it's, you're, you know, the, the goal at Creative Ladder is to help fill this gap within, with awareness and accessibility. How, do you, how, did you, um, how did that evolve? How did that come about? Yeah, I, I think um, the best way to explain you know, my understanding how this came together is to just sort of tell you the story that you know, leads from what I was saying with um, District of Clothing in 2020. Um, into August of 2020, Ryan Reynolds, my co-founder, was the keynote for the Ad Week Brand Week conference, which, like everything else during 2020, was moved from in-person to virtual. And um, he was, at that time, like he always does and has con- continued to show me that he does, was leading with his heart. And um, again, if you can remember, the world was sort of on fire especially the United States, there were um, protests and marches happening in multiple cities across the country during that summertime. And he wanted to give back in a way that was meaningful, in a way that would be tangible, and in a way that would also be um, hopefully advantageous to, to, to creatives. And so he offered 100 um, generally marginalized creatives access to um, the Brand Week Conference. Um, through, through sponsorship, I was on that list. Um, I sent a couple of tweets just because I was so moved by his speech and by some of the other speeches that were happening and keynotes that were happening during that, that uh, conference. And um, it's my understanding that David Greiner, who was then the, my also other co-founder, three of us, um, he was the journalist that was interviewing Ryan during the keynote. Once they completed it, they saw, you know, the wonderful response that they got um, in terms of how people were saying this was really um, like instrumentally helpful and, and really very tangible and thank you. And they just kept thinking of other ways in which they could um, continue that progress, continue that process and continue to help. Um, I, have told them that, you know, I consider that them spending their privilege. Um, And I guess as they were pinging each other, um, my name kept coming up and then they um, started reaching out. This is 
you know, if you could take it from August to September, I want to say they started reaching out in October. At that time, I was planning a wedding and I was like, hey, can I call you back? You know, um, I'm <laughs> planning my wedding, my COVID ceremony. <laughs> I'm a little um, busy. <laughs> I'm a little busy right now. While also homeschooling my, you know, soon, my, my new bonus boys soon to be officially stepchildren. And um, we happened to get married on what my husband and I referred to as the happiest day of 2020, which was November 7th. Um, which was the day that they announced Biden's win for the presidency. Um, so we were worried about having, you know, 14 or 15 people at our outside courtyard wedding. And it was probably close to 25, maybe 30,000 people. Our hotel was actually on Black Lives Matter Plaza. So it was, <laughs> it was literally the happiest day of 2020. Um, and they reached out about a week after the wedding. Um, and I was sort of blown away, really very honored by the opportunity, but also I hadn't worked, um, you know, I'd consulted with organizations and nonprofits, but I had never worked myself, um, especially not as a CEO with, as a non, with a nonprofit, excuse me. And um, I just said, if you could give me a moment, I need to run this by my now husband. And, um, you know, I said, babe, Ryan Reynolds and he's like yes whatever it is you know yes <laughs> um and when I <laughs> when I fully explained everything and we talked it over it was just you know this this is such a wonderful opportunity to be able to not only continue to provide a service but to actually be of service to my fellow creatives and um let you know this is the way a way to be able to also impact people in a much um on a larger scale in a more deeply impactful way. And so that, you know, we, I would say we kicked off working together maybe that first week of December, 2020. Um, and here we are today, we made the announcement June 21st um, of 2022 this year. And um, it's been a whirlwind, a wonderful whirlwind ever since December, 2020 feels like it was, 20 years ago, maybe at times. And then it also feels like it was only two months ago. And June 21st, 2022 feels like it was yesterday, but it also feels like it was a year ago. Um, I say all that to say that we have been making wonderful progress on standing things up for a creative ladder. Um, and it's been really um, exciting to see the response we've received. It's also been um, very grounding to see the response we've received because you realize once again that the issues that you've experienced and the issues that some of your friends or colleagues have experienced are um, pretty across, pretty much across the board and um, we have a lot of work to do. So we are excited to um, continue our mission forward of um, networking with, connecting, inspiring, and elevating a new inclusive group of um, generation of of, of um, creatives but we are also excited to be able to link arms with the organizations who have already been doing this work um, and to both you know work as a bridge and also as a ladder so that we can continue lifting as we're fine we just realized that this is a really a really very widespread issue um, that needs to be collectively um, you know, Collective, we need to work collectively to be able to make a difference here. I'm interested. First of all, I'm assuming that what you were referring to is that people of color or people of other origins uh, don't or aren't offered the same opportunities in the creative world. That's what you're talking about, correct? Yes, so. absolutely. No. So, so I'm building on that. I'm just, I'd like to pick you up on, on the name of, of the organization, Creative Ladder, because, um, again, because of the world that we find ourselves living in, people would say, well, you know, people need a hand up, need, people need a hand out or what have you. You've selected, or you, you and Ryan Reynolds and, and Mr. Greiner have all selected the phrase ladder, because with a ladder, you climb up yourself. But the next rung is available to you. Is that sort of what you were thinking? No, I mean, I think our first thought was thinking of when you think about the corporate ladder, 
how can we flip that to be more creative? And then um, just as a community, yeah. we believe in lifting as we climb. So we're all climbing this thing together, but we can, we can, you know, let's try to lift each other up while we're doing that and continue moving forward. Um, sky is yeah. the limit. And if you think about it, ladders, they end, but they also don't necessarily end, you know? So the hope huh. is that we can just continue moving things forward and, and continue climbing higher. What's the, what's the reaction been uh, from the people that you're working with? Whew. Um, it has been phenomenal. I will say that you don't fully understand the, um, the nature of a global celebrity until you're in the tailspin of it. Um, I think that's the proper way to say like the, the tailspin, you know, the um, response the has been, yes, the response has been overwhelming in the best way. Um, it's also been interesting to, you know, be on calls with clients prior to the announcement and everyone happy and moving forward on the agenda and excited to be able to do whatever these desired outcomes are that, you know, that we're, we're creating together and then post announcement um, to sort of be wrapping up with a couple of clients and then maybe bursting into tears on a call and saying, these are the things that I've experienced. How can we bring creative ladder to my particular organization or folks sending um, both DMs and emails and saying, Diana, these are some of the things that I've been experiencing. I'm so happy that you're tackling this on a different scale um, and, and in, a, in various creative industries. How can I be involved? Um, we have received over 8,000 people seeking mentorship. Um, and that number could be different, but at least, uh, you know, in the last week or so we were up to 8,000 people um, seeking mentorship, which just goes to show you that um, there are people who are already in our industry and there's people who are interested in becoming members of our various creative industries. who are seeking guidance and seeking um, tools to help them continue to move forward. And um, just someone to help navigate the, the journey, the creative journey, mm-hmm. because it's not one that they um, hear about and see about as frequently as you might, you know, say a lawyer or a nurse or a doctor or an engineer. Um, It's really very important that we do, um, you know, that that we are mindful about making folks aware at the high school level that these jobs exist and understanding that the things that you're doing, you know, 12, 14, some kids maybe up to 16 hours a day on your phone, you could actually turn into a job in the future. Um, And then also helping college students navigate the various pathways and give them better access or different types of access towards um, internships and and various different pipelines to employment. Um, I think on all of my calls, I try to just let everyone know and remember that it's not a talent deficit. The talent is there. It's an opportunity deficit. And so we want to make sure that we are constantly engaging with both young people um, at a high school level, as well as a collegiate level, as well as young professionals to just be able to make them aware, connect them with people who look like them or might have a better understanding of their background and experience. And then as well um, to help them navigate the the path forward towards leadership, towards C-suite, or even towards pivoting. You know, it's... an interesting time again here in 2022. Um, I'm, I've just learned about quiet quitting, I believe is the proper way to, to say it um, from TikTok. Um, and seeing that there are so many people who are really struggling um, because of the microaggression, because of the, you know, trying to navigate how to balance working from home and, and growing up a family um, and trying to also be able to manage re- remote teams but they're not necessarily receiving those leadership skills and trainings that are needed. And they're also not necessarily receiving them from a perspective um, that can be, um, you know, understood for people of color. Hmm. Sounds to me like what you're doing is uh, discovering that uh, there are a lot of dreamers out there who want to become doers and, uh, and you've sort of, you're offering them that, you're opening that door. You know, each week we ask this question. Uh, so we're going to ask it to you as well. 
uh, thinking about the um, hurdles that you had to overcome, the fact that you're now discovering that there are so many other people out there like you, um, the fact that you are now sort of offering a creative ladder to many people who may not have had anywhere to go before. Um, why, do you, why do you believe in people? Uh, I love this question. Um, I, you know, humanity is such a beautiful, simple, yet complex. Um, it, it, we're, we're all very simple. We're all, but at the same time, we're all incredibly complex and we come from various histories and backgrounds. Um, I believe in people because I, 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 I want to start off and just say, you know, I've, I believe in God and I believe that God has created people to be resources to help each other to continue to move forward. I think if we look back um, and just see what was done during the civil rights movement, during the women's suffrage movement, um, and we see that, you know, when people come together with like minds and, and open hearts and a desire to move forward, we can do that. And um, I believe that this world is a beautiful place and has lots of, work that needs to be done to help us all be able to um, exist in a peaceful, happy, civil manner. And I think that we all have been given certain gifts to be able to, to move that forward. Um, you know, I, I believe in love. I believe in um, goodness. I believe in hope. And I've been blessed to be around wonderful people in my family and, and even in my career as well, um, who are reflective of that and who, um, you know, continue to continue lifting and climbing and that I couldn't be more inspired by, um, my community, by my family, by my ancestors, um, by my grandmother, by my, you know, my grandfather didn't make it past the sixth grade and to see, He's no longer with us, but to know that he can look down and even just see me on this podcast today talking about him and the things that he did um, to put me here. I mean, how can you not believe in people and goodness? We're all Deanna, on the ladder. thank you so much for your time. Yeah, we all are on that ladder. Yeah, we're all on that ladder. Thank you, Deanna. Yeah. Thank you for having me. So this was much. wonderful. Thank you so much. We're so appreciative. Thank you so much. Amy, I think one of the most fascinating things about believe in people and people who believe in people is that they don't forget there are other people out there. And that sounds exactly what Diona has done when with her involvement in the creative ladder with uh, Ryan Reynolds. Yeah, and it just goes to show, Kevin, that when your passion beats your purpose, your uh, especially Diana's uh, world she's unstoppable and it which uh, helps serve other people so if you want more information about creative ladder please go to creativeladder.org and you'll get further information around what the organization is all about and if you want to watch more of these inspiring podcasts please subscribe to believe in people thanks so much thanks kevin thank you see you